following video interview is controversial in nature and does not necessarily reflect the views of the producers nor mainstream academia. The viewer is encouraged to refamiliarize themselves with the standard historical and scientific text before making presumptive conclusions. I'm not surprised at this recent scandal that they dug up about the dumbness of the school books they're writing. Here's the government telling these outrageous lies to every child in America, every adult in America, and every old person in America. They've been stealing and hiding technology for so long, they don't want it to move any faster. Welcome to the 33rd Parallel, a video series about science, technology, and the politics that control it. For a long time now, scientists have been busy congratulating each other for proving some aspect of the theory of relativity. As recently as 1995, they've rewarded their colleagues with Nobel Prizes and declared long-held beliefs about the theory as proven fact. Meanwhile, we, as part of the unwashed masses, wait patiently for our eminent scientists to let us in on the joke. Aside from the atomic bomb, just what part of this illustrious concept can we hold in our hands and use in our daily lives? One is left wondering if scientists even care about the day-to-day -day phenomena that are still left unexplained. We may ask, what is gravity? And the answer is gravitons. Or, what is electricity? Well, it's electrons. Aside from their precious relativity, are there coexistent theories that are worth considering? After all, the majority of our greatest scientists Michael Faraday, James Clerk Maxwell, Sir William Crookes, and Lord Kelvin never even heard of relativity, nor would it have helped them if they did. Just what made scientists want to embrace the peculiar claims of a second-rate clerk in a Swiss patent office as the preeminent end-all to scientific progress? As almost an apology to the unworkability of Einstein's rants, we are offered a steady stream of new and ever more complex quantum mechanics and string theory to dazzle us or baffle us beyond belief. If Michael Faraday and Sir William Crookes never used relativity to further their understanding of gravity and electrodynamics, just what did they base their experiments on? And why do we never re-examine those concepts? Is there a forgotten physics with a different set of rules, hidden away from us early in the last century by a powerful elite who fear that the technology based on it will strip away their power and wealth and liberate us from their grip a bold and outrageous statement that can never be proven, right? Wrong. William R. Lyon is our guest tonight. He's the author of three books. Pentagon Aliens, formerly Space Aliens from the Pentagon, now in its third printing, Occult Ether Physics, and The Free Energy Surprise. Mr. Lyon was born in Big Spring, Texas, and raised in the boom towns of the great West Texas Wildcatters. He had the opportunity of being educated about fuel and its impact on industry firsthand. From there, he pursued an interest in aviation in Army Air Force, where he earned a position in Air Force Intelligence. He has acquired a BS degree with a double major in Art and Industrial Technology from Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas in 1969. He also has the distinction of living in New Mexico for the past 25 years. 
During a time and place where knowledge of saucer technology necessarily meant knowing individuals who worked on top secret projects at Los Alamos and Alamogordo were individuals such as Werner von Braun and his Nazi collaborators were well known to the community at large. Where, much like those individuals who had the misfortune of living in or near Mena, Arkansas, never got the chance to tell the rest of the world what was really going on. Well, today, Mr. Lang will do just that. Mr. Lang, welcome to the 33rd Parallel. Okay, I'd like to uh, get into some uh, free energy technology <clears throat> now. Um, the first thing I'm really fascinated about is uh, your uh, discussion of the atomic hydrogen torch. Uh, and if, if anybody's a welder these days, they probably haven't even heard of an atomic hydrogen torch. Uh, maybe you might want to explain a little bit about that and why it's so special. Interesting thing is, since I came out with this material just this year, in, in the immediate future, General Electric is now issuing a new version of an atomic hydrogen torch. Isn't that How interesting? How about that? And How did that happen? A, a person phoned me the other day and told me all about it. And uh, they have a new atomic hydrogen torch they're, they're, they're preparing to release for the public. <laughs> And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Isn't that a coincidence that it was dead for all those years? Yeah. And now I published something on it, and now they're coming out with it. Now, I wonder how they're going to uh, explain the, the uh, inordinate amount of energy. Uh, you might want to uh, maybe uh, talk about why this is so special, this torch. Well, of course, the discovery of the atomic hydrogen, what I call the atomic hydrogen process, was supposedly made by Langmuir about 1909 or 1912. And uh, he was a chemist who had a lot of uh, discoveries in the area of uh, electrolysis and, and so forth. And uh, he uh, claimed, and of course, the thing about Langmuir is he was an early relativist. So right. he believed in the relativistic, what I call RQMs, relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, they... Uh, he basically, you know, believed in the idea that however much energy was produced when you, when the hydrogen recombined, was the amount of energy it took to separate the hydrogen molecules into diatomic, uh, from diatomic molecules into monoatomic hydrogen. So basically, this process involves the separation of hydrogen, which tends to come as, uh, as uh, diatomic molecules, two two atoms together. Uh, into its separate atoms, and then when those atoms come back together, they release 109 kilocalories per mole. It sounds like a and lot. The molecules, uh, you know, per uh, the mole, and so that is a lot of energy. Now, what I found was a, a well-known Encyclopedia of Science, which says that it takes 103 calories per gram mole to separate the hydrogen, although the relativistic Quantum mechanics say that it takes the same amount of heat to separate the molecules as you get back when they recombine. So you're getting nothing. In you're, this you end reaction. up getting it all that you're just using electrical energy to separate it, and you get it back when it combines. Well, why even do it? I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, right. if you could just right. do it with electricity, except you get temperatures that are far above what you would get with an electric arc. In fact, you discovered a, an old uh, text on on uh, this reaction and even a photograph of uh, an atomic hydrogen torch. Uh, hydrogen being set free in a chemical reaction is often more reactive than hydrogen gas. The activity of such nascent, nascent newborn hydrogen in the act of liberation from its compounds is due to the hydrogen being in the atomic state. Uh, and down here, hydrogen molecules disassociate to atoms endothermically at high temperatures Heat of dissociation, about 103 cal calories gram mole, an electric arc, or, uh, or by irradiation. The hydrogen atoms recombine at the metal surface to provide heat for the acquired welding. Now, I've been assured that this has to be a typographical error on the, on the part of the Van Nostrand Encyclopedia people, even though this particular paragraph comes out of what is something like the fifth edition. Now, is you know, right? they just are so five editions of mistakes. Yeah, five editions they have just carried this 
nobody's caught it, you know. And the thing is, is this company published books on Tesla at one time when Tesla was alive. Oh, is that right? Yes, same company. Well, that's interesting that they would uh, claim that, uh, you know, they've made mistakes in five editions. Here we have this thing. This is circa 1933. Uh, it's a welding book, welding in its applications. And it has here atomic hydrogen arc welding. In general, it says here, molecular hydrogen or hydrogen in its normal state as distinguished from atomic hydrogen is a diatomic gas. That is, each molecule consists of two atoms. When hydrogen, when hydrogen is broken down into the atomic form, it is very active and has great tendency to recombine to form molecular hydrogen. This is exactly what happens in the atomic hydrogen process. When the molecular hydrogen passes through the arc, much of it is changed into the atomic state and thus absorbs considerable amount of energy. In escaping the arc stream, these atoms recombine into molecules again at the outer edge of the arc fan, and the extra energy is released as heat. This extra heat is added to the intense heat of the arc itself, produces a temperature that is somewhat higher than either the ordinary arc or the gas flame theoretical temperature of the atomic hydrogen flame has been found to be 7,254 degrees Fahrenheit. However, heat absorption due to the formation of atomic hydrogen, uh, well, it says here reduces this to 5,340 degrees. But it talks about the, uh, what you're talking about as mm -hmm. far as recombining. Yeah. So, uh, so all these books are making mistakes, I guess. The thing that's interesting is, is that liquid hydrogen is 99% uh, atomic hydrogen. Or, right? no, there's ortho and para hydrogen. I can't remember which is which, but one of those atomic, one of those states of hydrogen has a, a lot more energy. Just because they're, they're not pointed opposite directions, the atoms are pointed the same direction. And I thought, well, this is interesting. This is another free energy process hiding in there between ortho and monohydrogen. Uh, I mean, ortho and parahydrogen. And because it takes less energy to create parahydrogen than you get back when, you, when they uh, convert. How about that? And uh, that's just another one of those little free energy processes. The same thing happens... Oh, when you compress it and liquefy it, it takes less energy to vaporize it again than it took to compress it. Really? It, it, in other words, when you it, 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 you can vaporize it easier than you compress it, so you get a gain in energy just like that. And you can so do the it, same thing with liquid air. It happens quite a few times in nature, and and yet we're uh, we're taught to ignore that again. I don't see how people see. I don't think it's I don't magic. see how science people can explain this stuff away all the time. I just think that that these elements are absorbing energy from cosmic sources when they're in a state of change. And uh, because uh, Tesla's theory of radioactivity is that the radioactive elements are not producing the radiation. They actually are being produced by the element reacting with zero-point radiation, what he called the primary solar rays or starlight, a very high-frequency form of uh, radiation that's produced in stars and he called this the primary solar rays and I call it the zero point radiation because this matches the definition today and this radiation is ubiquitous it comes from all directions it's at so high frequency it doesn't react with most matter at all it passes right through everything but I believe that certain elements when they react uh, and, and change when they're in a change of state or let's say they're in an act of transmutation, mutation, such as in K capture, that they react with this and produce a radioactive effect. Because I don't think they've ever proven that mass loses weight through radiation. That's Is that what all they claim? strictly mathematical predictions. Yeah. Ah. According to E equals M C squared, if something sits there and puts out this high energy radiation, it's supposed to eventually convert all the mass as long as it's producing energy. radiation into pure, what they call pure energy. And that's the biggest joke I've ever seen in my life. There's no such thing as pure energy. Uh, what would be pure energy? 
energy, so energy is the ability is to do work. How can an right. ability have a pure form and some physical So in a state? way, it's a process of transition yeah. that creates the uh, work. It's, it's just the potential that exists. That's all energy is. It's not a physical entity any more than time is some sort of little entity flying around in space. Time is, a, is just a fiction that we've invented just as a convenience to describe the rate at which events occur. And, uh, and all of a sudden now we're supposed to think that it's, it, it's an entity in and of itself. Yeah, and we could travel in it. You know, like Maybe pretty soon they'll have time particles, like they have gravitons. Yeah. Uh, Timatons. Yeah. yeah. Chronotons. Oh, yeah. no, I better not say something like that. Next thing you know, I'll be seeing it in print. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, Tesla uh, has a very interesting take on uh, uh, iron, for instance, here. Um, he talks about uh, talks about it in terms of electricity. Uh, I'm a, let's see. Unless we should make a radical departure in the character of the electric currents employed, iron will be indispensable. Yet the advantages it, off, it offers are only apparent. So long as we use feeble magnetic forces, it is by far superior to any other metal. But if we find ways of producing great magnetic forces, then better results will be obtainable without it. In fact. I have already produced electric transformers in which no iron is employed and which are capable of performing ten times as much work per pound weight as those with iron. This result is attained by using electric currents at a very high rate of vibration produced in novel ways instead of the ordinary currents now employed in industries. I have also succeeded in operating electric motors without iron by such rapidly uh, vibrating currents that the results so far have been inferior. Uh, he has a whole different take on... Uh, now he's talking about replacing iron with aluminum. Yes. You see, now, you see which way he's moving towards something that's lightweight. And I have heard this before, that iron, that aluminum can be made to function as a ferromagnetic material. Aluminum? Yes. How about that? And you feel yeah. that Tesla might have been on, onto this? Yes. I think he might have developed this. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's, he disclosed that he had an, you know, a special generator that, that the his description of this generator's output was so phenomenal that it's almost incredible. Uh, but he said it was composed of aluminum, iron, and copper, combined in an unusual or uh, novel way. And uh, so I, I was, I've been mystified by this for quite some time. And uh, there's one of the uh, watt hour meters. I, I, this is what you were uh, alluding to, uh, or you, you feel that Tesla was alluding to, um, this being a Tesla invention originally, where he, uh, uh, basically this is a, uh, an elaboration on his unipolar uh, generator which he was experimenting with. Uh, this might have been one of the ultimate results of it. Could you go further into it? Uh, well, I just kind of stumbled across this with a, uh, at the time, back in the late 70s, I just wanted, I had an apartment in my house, and I wanted to know how much electricity was being used internally in that one apartment. So I picked up a couple of antique uh, watt-hour meters in Albuquerque at a, at a salvage place, but these were antiques, and they were they were they were two 110 meters, which I've been told are very expensive now to, to get one of those kind of meters. But anyway, I got these for a couple of dollars a piece, and I hooked them up in the apartment. But there were no labels on what were the end, what was the end wire, and what was the out wire. These were so antique that they just had posts on there for for connecting wires, and they were there was no label. So I just kind of figured out. Well, let's see, I'll run the end wires in here and I'll have two of them to do 220 for this apartment. Well, apparently I hooked them up backwards and uh, what they would do is the meter would spin quite rapidly when power first started to be used in the apartment and the more power they began to slow down and finally they would get when the power usage was higher they would just sit and vibrate and I called it snoring because these things made a, a vibration. The whole house would vibrate with these things. Would, really? Wah, yeah. Wah, wah, yeah, it'd make the whole house shake. And if the power usage went up higher, they went in reverse. And the electric bill on the whole complex dropped by about a third. 
So these so meters appear to be electricity yeah, into this. These, they appear to be generating power. And uh, so I just got to uh, when I was at a I was at a salvage place looking for some metals and whatever in my little inventor trip that I do. And there was an old man there, and his name was Dort. And he was from Virginia, and he says, my father invented, and I started talking to him about these one-hour meters because we he, he was interested in this sort of stuff. And he says, well, my father invented the original generator that's used on highly top-secret Navy subs today. And Here we go uh, with it the was subs based again. on the Tesla invention, and the Nazis stole it. And now the government uses it, and it's highly classified. And I told him about these meters. He said, when that meter is stationary and vibrating, he said, that's the center of load. He says, aluminum is the reflector, and uh, copper is the active element, and iron is the magnetic. And, uh, and uh, he said that, that this kind of technology was in, incorporated in his father's invention, which is a Tesla oscillator. And in investigating his Tesla oscillators, he, Tesla had an oscillator in the 1890s that had a, a little piston in it that was driven by compressed air. And it only had to vibrate about a sixteenth of an inch, just hum. But the inductors, there were two inductors that were on a shaft that the piston was attached to, and these two inductors were just windings that cut the magnetic lines of force in these two big cores. And the windings were over 50 miles long in that. And uh, so that would correspond to what uh, Tesla talked about, uh, 925 mile an hour, a uh, mile uh, wavelength, which would be for the Earth about uh, 13 and a half cycles per second. And this is what they use for ELF technology. And that means that the Navy submarines are not, that the ELF waves are used not only just to transmit messages, they're also used to transmit power. So the submarines actually, uh, and this is what the Germans used in their electro U-boats. Always, always the uh, underlying theme of submarines and submarine power. Yeah, it's being like, a clandestine type of uh, piece of equipment to begin with, uh, that what better thing to power it? Tesla said one of his greatest discoveries at Colorado Springs was the discovery of te terrestrial waves that went from pole to pole. And that was one of the discoveries that he made. So basically this, stealth, this ELF technology uh, would do nothing but like make this wave energy in the Earth accessible. And uh, that, that would be how they would get a 13,000-mile range out of these submarines in World War II. Interesting. Well, we have up on the screen now um, uh, Tesla's unipolar... 30,000 uh, miles. Take it back. 30,000 miles. 30,000. That's a lot. It sure is. Um, his version of the uh, unipolar generator, which, of course, uh, as, as you can see, is very similar to uh, the uh, watt-hour meter, uh, suspiciously similar. Uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and it's funny because w w when I heard you speaking about this uh, once before, uh, and, e and even in your book, I I'm thinking to myself, if, if this were to be true, that somehow they have, they have uh, surreptitiously been using this, this equipment, then I could pick up one of these meters somewhere and... Uh, and the only working components, or, or the, the most rel relative, relevant components, would be uh, the disk and the magnets, and it would all be the same. And the rest of it would just be cosmetic, or possibly uh, a prop, even. Well, that's that's pretty, you know, stretching, uh, you know, stretching credulity to the limit. And I just wanted to see how how far this this idea went. So I went to my uh, Scrapyard, <laughs> my uh, local scrapyard, and was able to uh, uh, dredge one of these things up. Steve, can you get this? Um, and as you can see, it's a uh, West, uh, I believe this is Westinghouse, watt hour meter. And it has, you know, a lot of us have been looked at this from time to time in our backyard and wondered what all this, this wonderful dealy bobs are <laughs> uh, up, in the, up in the front here that, that runs all these, these great little dials and things and you know it's just en endless technology here 
And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, maybe uh, it isn't what Mr. Line is talking about because of all this, this wonderful stuff here. But if it's true, it, this, this, all this stuff would be ir irrelevant. And I look back here and I found that there were two screws and only two screws holding this to the rest of the apparatus. And when this drops off, what do you have left here is the disc, the aluminum disc, the magnet here, and two electromagnets in the back. And Tesla and that's said all. it was essential the magnets were weak. The, this is a weak magnet right here, a weak permanent magnet right there. The, the reason for the weak magnet is so the magnetic field can be reversed and oscillate as it bounces off the aluminum. Right. So here we have a relatively modern version of this, and it's a Faraday disk or a Tesla disk, uh, more properly termed, running the whole show. Now, uh, what I'd like to do is compare this to an older meter. Well, according to their theory, they're saying that when current passes through the flux, or rather, the flux is, is, runs counter to the, to the electrical uh, flux that's created by the electromagnet. The idea is that when the flux passes through the disk, it's supposed to create a th thrust on the disk and turn it a certain direction. And then the metering gadget is supposed to measure the number of times per second or minute or whatever that this thing turns and all these little gears and show you all these little digits to, to, to measure the amount of current that you're using. But the truth of the matter is, is there's something here that uh, uh, bears looking at because uh, it's, it's really a generator. Now, uh, what, would, what would be the purpose of them uh, uh, plugging in uh, free energy generators to each, each of our houses? Uh, it could increase the amount of power that they're actually uh, being paid for. In other words, they could generate the seed power to make this thing oscillate, and then you would be billed for what the meter says you used, when in fact the meter is generating a lot of the power. <laughs> Along with uh, the poles and the and right. the and the plates underneath all the poles, they'll have copper plates under. And you feel that the power stations alone wouldn't wouldn't be enough to uh, keep this moving along. Yeah, I think. Well, they, the power that we get here comes from Four Corners region. That's you know that's way up in the north, uh, on the corner of New Mexico is where that's right. that's coming from. And it just seems to me that there's an awful lot of power to be used there, and I don't know how they're generating that much up there for, for sure. all the uses that's going on. I kind of tend to think that uh, that some of that power is coming from earth source and also from these little generators which are also extracting that energy from the starlight and or photon starlight? energy, whatever you want. It's sometimes called starlight. It's called, some people use the term zero point energy, but that's an incorrect term. That's a relativist term. And that's the zero point oscillations in the space time continuum, <laughs> continuum type of stuff. Go back you know. to that again. The quantum fabric, or, you know, they use all these little sure. weird terms. But that's not supposed to be true according to relativist theory because you can never have one half quantum. In other words, they use this all the time. They use this in the neutrino theory. But according to the relativist theory, you can never have a half quantum. Hmm. You've got to have a full quantum because. The electron is indivisible. Oh, right, yeah. And that's not true. Um, let's compare the uh, uh, fairly modern uh, watt meter to something, uh, again, we dredged up uh, in our, our little uh, explorations. This thing is called a frequency relay. This is much older. This is uh, circa 1930s, possibly. And as you can see, uh, it has all the relevant components on it. It has the disk, the weak magnet, and the electromagnets, and, and a power resistor up here, but basically that's it. And this has an inhibitor that causes it to oscillate. So, uh, your comments? Yeah, it's, it's, it closes the switch. It shows here, it says uh, close left at 61.9 cycles. Close right, they don't even show but you see two little contacts, one here and one there. When this disc goes here, it closes that one. When it goes here, it closes this one. So it's oscillating back and forth. And I assume that it has something to do with these coils out here. But 
I don't know what a frequency relay would be, except this 61.9 is almost 62 cycles per second. It, it sounds to me like it, uh, if, the, if the frequency isn't right, it opens or closes the switch here. But it, it also could be vibrating back and forth. Uh, it, it's got a limiter on it and a spring that makes it return to one position. Uh, but it looks like some very mysterious little gadget. Yeah, it's suspicious how, um, how similar that is to uh, a modern day gadget without all the bells and whistles on the front. Uh, apparently they weren't uh, too interested in concealing technology as much as well according to that, that diagram that you had on there earlier where it showed the unipolar generator uh, you can see where Tesla shows in the illustration that the positive charges go one way in the magnetic field and the negative charges go around the other way uh, it uh, here okay now you can see one set of charges uh, goes this way, and the other set goes back this way. I can't see the markings on there, but in that magnetic field, because a magnetic field will, will do work on moving charges. And then the current is, you see you have a loop here. Here you've got a thing on the edge to pick up current, and here you've got a return loop near the center. Now. Tesla had a subdivided disk. He said if you subdivided it this way, you could energize the field. And if you subdivided it the other way, you could de-energize the field. So if you had a disk with subdivisions going this way, back that way, this way, and back the other way, then when you spun this disk between these fields, you would cause an alternating magnetic field. If you put windings on that field, you have a generator that's far uh, beyond the current that could be generated by this disk generator. And this could be as big as uh, the watt meters we just uh, yeah. showed. And that's you all generate, you need. You get an oscillating magnetic field with windings around it, and you could get a lot more energy this way. And this is, this is how most of his technology that got high output worked. But he described one generator that was special that, that we don't have anything on, the government's concealed it that the output was phenomenal. And uh, it sounds like the water iron meter from his description of it. Wow. From what we can get our hands on. And uh, just for good measure here, we have just another photograph of, of the same thing, basically, with, with the magnets and the disc, the weak magnets in the front here. Yeah. And the disc going through it. Um, and this business. <laughs> That's just to, to measure the disk span. But the, the one that I hooked up backwards, the disk would rotate fastest when the current usage was lowest. And then as it, the usage went up, it began to sit stationary and uh, vibrate. And then it began to rotate the opposite direction. And, uh, so it indicated to me it's generating more power than it's, uh, than it's being used at that point when it's going backwards. When it's at stationary, the center of load is generating as much as, as you're using. And the, the fact is, is during World War II, the Germans used some of these devices, which were powered by projected beam. Uh, they were robotic devices. Uh, what kind of projected beam? Would that be microwave? Power beam. Uh, it's a special beam that Tesla developed, uh, and he described it. He described the device around 19... 15 as his dirigible torpedo, which he had tested, and he said it was capable of uh, 300 miles a second, which is 1.5 million miles per hour. Do you and think he was exaggerating? A lot of people feel that. I don't that think that was, it may not have been an exaggeration. I don't know how fast this ship that I saw was capable of going, but I know that it had a way of, and from the way I understand the technology, it's totally different from this, this air spike thing. Uh, the way the flying saucer technology works, it's, it's explained in the, 1890, in the 1890s writings of Tesla and a few other major scientists in the world. Uh, the, the 
ether particles are stretched in the front with a DC brush discharge. Uh, that brings in something called the tubes of force, which are electrical force that carry momentum. And when this enters the ship and are dissolved in the ship, uh, it imparts momentum at 90 degrees to the electric and magnetic forces. Uh, so on the in respect, you, you can control yes. momentum. Uh, yeah, it's, it all or has you can to... Control, can you control inertia yes. electrically? Well, the way I understand it, and just from my own analysis, Inertia and momentum are the same thing. Uh, inertia is the tendency of a body to remain at rest or in its state of, in its particular state of motion. Whereas momentum, well, momentum is the same thing. Uh, bodies in motion tend to remain in motion. Uh, uh, however, <clears throat> according to Tesla and J.J. Thompson, the discoverer of the electron, momentum is the product of these tubes of force which exist in space and they're at random until they're united by this by this brush discharge or by a body moving through space then that body accumulates a certain number of these tubes and that imparts momentum to the body so if you can block these ether particles from passing you can block inertia and that's exactly what Tesla's so this is actually in the literature uh by J.J. Uh, Thompson and Tesla. Yes. We're talking the 1800s. Yes. Getting back to uh, saucer technology, German saucer technology, um, you claim uh, in your book that you uh, were at a salvage yard and had collected something. Uh, in fact, you have a photograph in the book. You call it a pile talker compass. Could you explain a little bit about that? Well, literally, pile talker compass means polar slave compass, talker meaning daughter, so it's kind of a little humor in there, German humor, that the daughter is equivalent to a slave. Uh, but what that means is that this is a slave compass, so there's a master compass, which is a gyro. Uh, the gyro is the master compass, and the, the polar slave compass will then pick up the heading that is calibrated into the master gyro, uh, which... Uh, this particular device is it's mounted this way, so the dial is 360 degrees this way. It's, it's set off in 30 degree increments, and it has a dial here, which you turn 30 degrees left, 30 degrees right. You can also do 60, 90, any 30 degree increment. But this device then has a little electric motor on it, so that when the ship changes directions, let's say that you turn the flying saucer 90 degrees to the right. Well, pile th the main compass is calibrated to show true north. So when the ship starts moving this direction, then this little motor cuts on and rotates a dial that's with gears on it around to show you the correct flight heading according to nice. true north on the master compass. And the reason this kind of device was necessitated in the first place was because the flying saucer has a electric field around it that makes an ordinary compass totally useless. And another reason is the flying saucer moves so fast that you're, you're going to be over the next state in a few seconds, you know, if you don't cut the power. And uh, so this particular one that I have is a primitive device compared to what they must have now, uh, but it was the only thing they could come up with to navigate these saucers. And uh, these devices, which you have here, you have a couple. Yeah. We have here um, something from an American salvage yard uh, in California. Uh, very similar to uh, what Mr. Lein's talking about as far as a, uh, uh, the German version, as far as the 30-degree um, uh, increments, correct? Uh, and it has a, a dial which adjusts here. This thing is thrashed to bits, so... I'll have to uh, excuse its shape. Um, and we have a, the specifications here. Indicator gyromagnetic compass type V7A. Specification mil 15126A. Uh, order number AF23804. Stock number 62631570. Curecroft compass. I'm sorry, Kierfot Company Incorporated Property of U.S. Government. 
Uh, I bought it at a salvage yard, so everything's totally legal. <laughs> uh, and it's very similar to what uh, Mr. Line is talking about in his book. Uh, you might want to uh, point out the similarities or differences. Uh, well, do you feel that uh, this was from an airplane or, or a oh, saucer? Yeah. Or? This is probably this is Air Force USAF Type V Seven A. Now, uh, this is not the same kind of device that I have, though. But it uses uh, some of the same technology. This is a navigator. Uh, device that will give a true reading for north, south, and in, in the different degrees. And it's graduated for any of these headings on here. Uh, the one that I have, the reason I knew what it was when I saw it was because when I was a, uh, a boy, I slept in the backyard to watch these ships coming from New Mexico at night, flying in squadrons. And they would turn in 30-degree increments, 30, 60, 90, 180. And I could tell they were, they were at very high altitude, and I hadn't seen one up close. All I could do was see them in the sky at night, high in the sky, navigating, doing maneuvers. And I would see a bunch of them flying along, and I'd see one coming along. And it looked like a star, bright light, and it would go along and then suddenly do a, a, a instant. Without slowing down, it would do an instant turn, angular turn, and it was in these 30 degree increments. Well, when I saw this device on a scrap heap in Albuquerque, I knew that's what it was. And I picked it up, and certainly the, the label on the back, on the side of it, showed that it was a pile talker compass, and it came from, it was labeled KT-small-p-large-2, KTP-2, uh, manufactured by List on October the 10th, 1943. Uh, it was a guidance compass from a German 1943 vintage flying saucer. And now, what the device, and this was when I bought it, was in 1979. It was classified. So how did it get in this scrap heap? Soon after I got this device, the government apparently found out that I had it. So they went to the scrap dealer to find out how he got it. And the scrap dealer then said, I got it from a guy at Sandia Base. So they went, the guy at Sandia Base was the guy who normally brought scrap, released for salvage, to him. This guy was stealing classified, he didn't know it was classified salvage when he stole it and sold it. And so they put him under surveillance, they caught him doing it again, and they put him in jail. And then that information got back to the scrap dealer and got back to me. So that was classified information. They weren't supposed to let that kind of information get out. The scrap dealer wasn't supposed to know it. I wasn't supposed to know it, but I know it. And I found it out, so I knew that they couldn't come and get this thing back from me without confirming what it was. And why was some, some device from 1943 still classified? If it was That's nothing more than an inertial guidance system. That's a good point. If it's, if it's present on every airplane in the German uh, Air Force, and it's present in and every airplane. The dial is in the middle on it, and it's clear that this device controls the direction of the flying saucer, and that the saucer can turn in any of these 30-degree increments, just like the ones that I saw. But this one, uh, you feel, is, is different in that this, this would be for an airplane? Yeah, this would be for, for navigating, and what the purpose of this is, is you're using an inertial guidance system, or navigational system, mm -hmm. to maintain a true north heading so that you know what direction you're really going. Right. Uh, ordinary compass could be influenced by all sorts of things. Magnetic right. uh, uh, declination, uh, metal on the ship, electrical things can influence it. But on this device, it's strictly inertial. So when they take off, they calibrate the master compass. No matter which way the ship turns, it maintains its true heading in relation to this compass. And so they can always know what their heading is okay. with accuracy for navigational purposes. Um, also in this uh, wonderful... Uh, junkyard that uh, uh, we were in. Uh, there's another piece of uh, salvage here called a Master Indicator Gyro Flux Gate Compass. Uh, do you see any relation between these two? Yeah, both of these more or less are the same thing. This is a World War II variety, and this is a later version, which you can see the jet plane on the pointer here, right. that this comes from the jet era. So mm -hmm. as best I can tell it, it may be made in the 50s, maybe 54, because of these numbers. In which case, it, 
it's it's definitely in the jet plane era. So it serves the same purpose. Yeah, and it's smaller, more compact. And this is a World War II version that was used to get a correct heading with an inertial compass. And so you have a ma this is the master indicator, as it says on its. Uh, it says master indicator. So this will give them a true heading for north, and then they can plan all of their navigation around that. They want to know where north is. So the technology they might have quelled from this type of knowledge of uh, uh, inertial guidance systems yeah. to, to use on but the But I think flight. the device that I have, the Pile Doctor Compass, I believe that it originally was a Nikola Tesla invention that was, that was developed in conjunction with with Sperry Gyroscope Company in 1917, because there's a documentation in my book that Tesla tested a, a robotic plane on a round trip, uh, 200 miles round trip flight in conjunction with Sperry. And they so, mentioned the, the company name, Sperry. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and, they do uh, a lot of. Uh, Elmer compass. Sperry was an, a friend of Tesla's. Tesla apparently developed this friendship. And, and and use Sperry to develop this thing on this robotic ship that was flown on a 200 mile. It was taken off, landed. Uh, I mean, uh, taken off again and brought back, uh, all robotically. And uh, it was the first flight of that type, uh, as far as I know. And I believe that because I found several other technologies that were properties of the Sperry gyroscope later Sperry Unisys, which end up in Nazi hands, there seemed to be a trading with the enemy thing going How on about there. That? And for instance, the Klystron tube, which was developed by the Varian brothers in 1939, was a, a Sperry property. And, the, and researchers claim that the uh, Nazis had the Klystron tube and show diagrams of it in Nazi documents. So it looks like the Klystron found its way along with the so pile the, doctor. The Nazis, uh, or, uh, the Nazis seem to have a a uh, very good handle on uh, microwave technology. Uh, well, the first guy they talking. sent over here in 1936, actually he was invited by the American Rocket Society and the National Geographic and the Smithsonian Institution and the Simon and Florence Guggenheim Foundation was a scientist, a rocket scientist named Billy Lay. And Lay was actually very, very the popular. tutor of Von Braun. Yes. And Lay came over here at the invitation of the American Rocket Society and all the rest to work with Goddard. Now, now, uh, what's the time period we're talking about here? 1936. Actually, he was invited around 1935. And he came over here and he defected. There was research being done prior to 1935 on rocket technology yes. by uh, individuals other than John Goddard yes. here in this country? Yes, uh, Robert Goddard. Ro I'm sorry, and, yes. And Robert Goddard. Uh, there was uh, a rocket scientist who lived in Santa Fe from, I believe, the late 20s. Uh, I know he was here all during the 30s. And uh, many people know him as a solar designer because he built a lot of solar houses and this sort of thing and wrote some books on the subject, but he was a rocket scientist whose rockets were actually outperforming all the other rockets before, but he used solid fuel. His name was Peter Van Dresser, and he was the author of Peter of the Van Dresser Constant, which Von Braun talks extensively about when he talks about his plans uh, to go to the moon. And because the Van Dresser's Constant was used to, to uh, uh, compute the trajectory uh, of the rockets, and it was also used to fire all those rockets into Belgium and England. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, Werner von Braun. Uh, his presence here in New Mexico uh, apparently goes back a little further than is widely understood. Yeah, this is all this People, is all purged and uh, and kept out of the books. Nobody's ever told about this. Right. But Van Dresser was angry because with Goddard because. Goddard worked originally, as I said, Lay was sent over here, but Lay defected. So they had to find a replacement, and they took young Von Braun and got him through his PhD program and promoted him as the director of research for rocketry in Germany and uh, at the Pain Mundi project. And they promoted him up and sent him over to replace Lay because Lay married a Russian ballerina named Olga Feldman and took out American citizenship papers by 1937, but 
Back in 1935, he had defected, so they, they had to get a replacement. Now, how they arranged this is beyond me, but sure enough, Von Brown came over here to replace Lay to work with Goddard for two years. However, what I found out was that he was working in a secret project at Los Alamos called P2, Small P, Large 2. This is probably the most controversial part about it. It's one thing to say uh, Werner von Braun is present here uh, prior to uh, the war. Now uh, you're claiming that he's responsible for um, technology other than rocketry. Um, Just, uh, you see, none of the misinformationists mention any, want to mention von Braun in relation to flying saucers. Uh, however, the this Germans... Is where, this is yeah. where you divert in your book and uh, you explain how you feel that he, uh, he's very much involved in it, or had been very much I involved. I don't know whether Goddard knew about Von Braun's work on the Flying Saucer, whether he was privy to it or not, but it appears that he may have been uh, because the U.S. government apparently didn't trust Lay at that time because he wasn't employed by the government. He worked as a, as a writer. He was a talented, very talented, intelligent person. And uh, I don't know whether he's still, he could even still be alive, I don't know. But he had studied with Hermann Oberth also, and, uh, who was the Hungarian rocket genius. But Goddard's rockets were outperforming all the German rockets, so they wanted to get what they could. That was the cover, but what they really wanted to do was test this flying saucer idea. Uh, and they didn't know, because the U.S. government had treated Nikola Tesla so shoddily as if they considered him nuts, and they wouldn't listen to anything he said. It's just that crazy old guy who comes in here wants wants to sell us or on these ideas, these wild ideas about ships that you know go you know so fast and so forth and defy gravity, and and so all of their experts who were MIT people mostly uh, just slandered Tesla up one side and down the other, and managed to convince the government that he was nuts, and so so the Germans. They sent their man to cultivate Tesla's friendship. Uh, they had a guy named George, George Sylvester Fierick in New York, came from a very well-known intellectual family, and Fierick cultivated Tesla's friendship, persuaded him along the lines of helping uh, with the German developments. And uh, I don't mention this much in the book, but I've, I've uh, some I put in on this. This is so you discovered a German connection with Yeah, Tesla. there's definitely. Tesla got the, the morning paper, uh, the morning German papers at the, at the German embassy every day. You know, so he'd gotten pretty tight with the German embassy because he sold stuff to the Germans in the past. He offered... This is prior to the war, so he's, he doesn't feel that this is some kind of treasonous act. Yeah, see, in a World War I, in 1914, Tesla offered his certain turbine to the U.S. Navy, and they weren't interested, so he sold it to the German Minister of High Marine uh, uh, in 1914. So they were interested. They bought his turbine. And uh, then in World War II, he offered all this stuff to the government. He offered the U.S. government ELF technology in 19. 14, 15, along in there, 17. Which they're using now yeah. as part of... He uh, offered them that technology yeah, the then, and they turned it down, you see. And eventually the Germans got hold of the technology, and uh, they were using it in World War II. Uh, they had submarines that used Tesla's oscillator to give them a 30,000-mile range. and uh, These were the electro-U-boats. Yeah, they had a Tesla oscillator that was driven off of partially off of thermodynamic and electromagnetic energy gathered from the Earth's field that oscillated at uh, harmonic of the Earth. And uh, they uh, used a gas to drive a little uh, piston that powered uh, some electric uh, inductors that cut the lines of force and generated electric current. This was a, a, a generator that Tesla developed in the 18. 90s, and uh, run by, uh, more or less, by gas, you know, uh, basically liquefied air. And run he was, through a Tesla turbine? Yeah. Well, uh, no, you run it, uh, well, he probably used his pumps to compress uh, the air in one stage of it, but what he was using 
was the same thing that Lindy filed patents on soon after la uh, Tesla's laboratory was burned to the ground, which makes you wonder. Another coincidence. Another big coincidence. And the Germans were, were storing huge quantities of liquefied air during before World War I. Uh, what were they going to do behavior. with all that stuff, sure, you know? Sure. So that was their U-boat stuff, you know? And uh, the uh, they were already planning on this stuff. Boy, it's, it makes your hair stand on man to think how how they moved into action so early, you know, to, to get this big thing going. But uh, So how does uh, this tie into uh, the P2 project with Von Braun and um, uh, Tesla's technology? How did Von Braun um, acquire what he needed to uh, uh, develop this, this? Well, they, they knew that, you know, that they, they had questions, you know, about Tesla's claims. So naturally, they wanted a proof of concept. So that's what they did at Los Alamos from 1936 to 38. However, I know that they didn't get all the technology uh, because the ship I saw in 1953 still had had the bug in it of precession problems. And you felt that it looked like it was lost. <laughs> yeah, it had a precession problem. Which if they if they had gotten all the technology from Tesla, which Tesla had. They would know would have known how to solve that problem, and so would the U.S. government. None of them paid any attention. If they'd looked in Tesla's document, documents from the 1890s, there was the the answer on how to stop that precession problem. And uh, I, I mean, the saucers would do this when they hovered, and they couldn't see anything. Everything's doing this outside, you know. Sure. And when they move fast, it's just a mere wobble, high frequency wobble. But uh, Tesla just bear, just merely did some experimentation to figure out how to solve this problem, and uh, apparently... Now, prior, prior you, you felt that this precession had mostly to do with the uh, the movement of the electrical uh, discharge. The brush uh, discharge, brush which discharge. is used. Uh, the brush, uh, the brush changed, discharge is just like the Earth. It's like the aurora borealis. You have a brush discharge in the Earth. The Earth draws in the, the tubes of force. And it's also the place where a huge current is going into the Earth from the sun. And uh, so there's a huge electric current going from the sun through frozen magnetic lines of force in space, through the Earth, and back to the equator of the sun, where it goes with the return current. And uh, that's what imparts the momentum to the Earth around the sun. So this is documented and proven by the scientist Johannes Alfen, the uh, Norwegian scientist who carried on some of the work of, that Alfin did was based on the work before him of uh, uh, Christian Birkeland, who, uh, who apparently was a Tesla nut too. And I believe that the reason they got into this area of research was because Tesla's dynamic theory of gravity, which was never published, had somehow leaked out. And so this it is looks something, like... This is something you've been attempting to reconstruct uh, through available text. Re the reference that you quote uh, is his lecture before the uh, uh, immigrant uh, welfare. Um, what, what year was yeah, that? Yeah, and he apparently had made the same announcements many years before, but he talked about he it. He actually and, used the term dynamic theory of gravity. Yes, he mentions this in a number of places in his, uh, in his writings and, and the stuff was published. Uh, however, he intended to publish it, but he never did, and he worked it out in 1893 and 94, which was, I got the papers that he wrote just before that, and that were part of his lectures in England, in New York, and Paris, and so forth, and in those lectures was this information that basically went into his dynamic theory of gravity, and then a few times, at later times, he would include little bits of the theory in there. And at one time, he released a lot of information on the theory in poetic form. And uh, so, uh, basically, what Tesla said was that, in the 1890s, was that uh, the brush discharge brought in the tubes of force, and according to J.J. Thompson, when the tubes of force are drawn into a conductor and dissolved in it, it imparts momentum because the tubes, the space contains the mechanism for momentum. Well, Alfin proves that most of the momentum of the solar system 
is in the planets. The sun has practically none because most of its momentum is being imparted and conduct or carried to the planets. So this idea of centrifugal force uh, creating some, you know, after baloney. Is they, uh, even Einstein said there's no force at a distance as far as gravity is concerned, and and he didn't even believe in the ether physics. But uh, basically, the theory is is that there <laughs> there are all these onion-like layers in, in, for instance, the solar system of the sun's electrical energy, and the planets are traveling along certain lines. It's of almost this. like a toroid, toroid yeah. shape. And the planets are driving along it, and, they, and the momentum they possess is brought in by the magnetic, by the electric current and the tubes of force, which are on the Earth, the aurora borealis, uh, this Birkeland, had said, well, there's no way that we can have these huge magnetic currents on the ground unless there's a current of billions of amps flowing into the Earth of the North Pole. And so the, the, the aurora is actually a brush discharge. Now, the aurora borealis is not the same as the aurora australis on the other end. It's a cloudier thing. That's positive corona versus negative corona. Negative corona. Then Tesla invented his highest form of his coil, was the single terminal coil, which he discovered, and he said it's my way of creating DC current through induction. And what it does is it creates a high frequency DC pulse. Uh, if you'll notice from those coils there, now he's got two on one circuit, you see. Right. Now that's... You, you can point with the... Uh, yeah, you've, you've got two coils and one circuit. You've got this coil here and this coil over here. And uh, then you you look at these coils and you look here. Let's see. There it says P1. See? Interesting. And reference. over here it says P2. Uh -huh. You know? So basically those are primaries, different primaries. And this, for instance, could be used. The only reason for having them in the same circuit is, is for a flying saucer. In other words, this coil. It doesn't coil, make sense the way it's uh, set up. I mean, if, if you are yeah. uh, signaling, as as the uh, the patent claims, system of signaling, <coughs> you wouldn't have a wire that's connected for 300 miles uh, to signal. Uh, that it defeats the whole purpose. Yeah, I mean. Uh, it's all on the same oscillator. He's running these things on one oscillator. Now, this one over here is the one we should be looking at if we right. can get it in the picture. Sure. All right, that's uh, more interesting because there you see the P1 and P2 right there, okay? Now, that's P2. It's expressed a little differently, but they didn't have these terms. Now, this is the 1890s. P2 that, yeah, that you described uh, in relation to the, the pile Toktor compass. Yeah, and here you've got a rotary spark gap yes. powering two different oscillators and notice that this capacitor has fewer plates than this one and yep. that's because this one is going to be tuned to a quarter wavelength this one's going to be turned tuned to a half or a full wavelength this one will produce a DC pulse the brush discharge what I call a pseudo -electro electrostatic discharge this one produces an alternating high frequency current this is used on the bottom or the back of the ship to to uh, destroy the inertia. This is used to create the momentum in the direction of travel. So you basically can accelerate the ship and turn it at 90 degrees with this system by controlling the discharges and, and a polarity on the sh uh, uh, surface of the ship. Now, uh, this uh, particular coil uh, is uh, if you notice that the primary is around the outside and so the voltage increases towards the center. The primary is also connected to the secondary so that at the same time the current enters the primary and travels around this direction, the current is entering the secondary and from the same source and traveling around this direction. That's an interesting and it's idea. like it's really kicking out that, that pulse, you see. Yeah, that's and totally different than how we're taught uh, to build our Tesla coils these days for yeah. our little hobby kits. Yeah. Uh, well, see, Tesla uh, said has that a purpose. the DC electrostatic charge uh, allows the ether carriers to enter easily into the ship, whereas in the high frequency, 
it tends to collect the, the positive ions around the opposite end of the ship, and the positive ions basically stop the flow of the ether. So you don't have any, any uh, resistance to movement because there's no inertia being imparted. Uh, you have an imbalance of forces. You have inertia in one direction and a blockage of the ether carriers on the other, so they can do nothing but enter the ship and dissolve and impart momentum. Now, to, to make this possible, the Earth is emitting uh, rapidly varying electric static forces of tremendous potential. Uh, and that rigidifies the ether in Earth's vicinity, which is why the Michelson-Morley experiment was false, is because the ether is stationary close to the Earth, but as you get further away from the Earth, the ether is more in motion. So if you tried to detect an ether drift close to the Earth, you wouldn't detect one. It's rigidified by the electrostatic forces and moves with the Earth, whereas outside the Earth's field, it's, it's in relative motion. So the ether drift experiment was based on a false premise of a dynamic ether. So uh, somehow uh, Tesla, or Von Braun, I'm sorry, uh, Werner Von Braun got a hold of this uh, technology and this is what he was developing in 1935? See, Billy Lay was an expert on microwaves. He was the greatest expert on the microwaves maybe in the world in 1935. And why would they need a microwave expert? Yeah, why would they need a microwave expert? Now, what's interesting about Billy Lay is the government hired him in 1944. The Burke Aircraft Corporation moved to the uh, environs of College Park, Maryland. And that, I believe, was the first American electropropulsive flying saucer project. That was after they discovered the Germans making these ships based on Tesla technology. In Maryland? And Maryland, it's right, College Park, Maryland, that's where the Goddard Institute is. How about that? How you know, cozy. And the Space Flight Center. <laughs> So that's a very high priority to some guy who writes science articles and poetry books for children about science, you know, that was suddenly whisked away by the government after they realized that he was the only guy they knew who could tell them anything about this stuff. And uh, so they hired him and put him to work right outside Washington, D.C. on some very high priority project. So Burke Aircraft keep an eye Corporation on of Georgia. Yeah. Uh, um, that's. That's interesting. I'd like to uh, uh, take a really strange jump here and talk about flying submarines. Uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, you included in your, your book an interesting chapter on flying submarines, question mark. You claimed that possibly the Germans had developed uh, or used uh, uh, submarine tubes to create flying machines. Yes. Well, it would be perfect. I mean, weight is no object because the electromagnetic interaction is 10 to the 40th power times stronger than the gravitational interaction. So that means that a very tiny amount of electrical energy can pick up a huge object. And uh, uh, what triggered my awareness of this submarine pressure hull concept was a person I know and his daughter witnessed one of these ships. Uh, this man went to Albuquerque to pick up his daughter at an airport, at the Albuquerque airport. And when they began to drive back, this ship was hovering over their car all the way back to Santa Fe. He even followed them to their house. And he said that it, uh, it had an old iron, what looked like an old iron ship's hull. With, he could see rivets on it and it hummed like a diesel engine. Apparently these doesn't, don't sound like alien spacecrafts from an advanced civilization. Well, the ones in South America have been seen belching black smoke and making clanking noises. Probably some <laughs> loose chain or something hitting the hull as they moved around, you see. I mean, but that would be perfect because the, the submarine pressure hull would be perfect for doing a prototype for Von Braun's planned Mars mission because uh, it contained a generator, uh, all sorts of equipment you would need in a hermetically sealed environment. And the pressure hull is round, just like a cigar, and has slightly tapered ends on each end. And then around that, they built all of the uh, you know, ballast tanks and other things, and the conning tower and everything. But the basic tube is just a round tube like that thing right there. 
Yeah, and this is a picture we have of what's called here early 50s cigar craft seen by Joe Fieri near Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And it's very similar to what you're describing. Well, I have seen videos of a ship and exact same description has been seen a number of times. Uh, one time off of uh, South Africa, another time in Virginia, uh, several, uh, quite a few times in Colorado, and I have a video of the thing up in Idaho. And you can see it's silver. It's like stainless steel. And uh, you can see halos around the ship. And as it's hovering, the halos are stationary. You can see the peaks and nodes, nodes of the high frequency, you see. And when the ship moves this way, the waves, nodes move. If, if the ship moves this way, the, the waves, nodes move this way. And if, if it's moving this way, they move the other way. But these are, are quite visible. I mean, I've seen it on television many times, and I've seen, and now I have my own video that was taken by some associates uh, of this ship. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, I can see the, the halo and the wave forms on the hull and uh, so it's it's perfect uh, you know verification of what I'm saying about the Tesla technology uh, the one that uh, the ship that really proved it to me was I saw a ship at uh, Hyde Park in 1996 in January 1996 while I was in the, at the 10,000 waves Japanese bathhouse and I was sitting in the tub with uh, six other people and there were some other people milling around and I saw this flashing object comes along and I said I watched it for a while and I said that is not an airplane and I said that's a UFO and this guy across the tub said ah it's a plane and I said well if it's a plane why did it just park and I said look here comes another one just like it and there comes another one parks near it and I said as long as they flash, I said that flying saucers put out a faint glow when they're moving slowly. When they move fast, they light up brighter, and that's the reason they're moving so slow, and the flash conceals the glow. I said, when they, if this thing were to fly fast, it would light up real bright. And the thing lit up. It was huge compared to the little flashes. It looked like a little plane. But when it lit up at orange length, it was this long, which means at that distance, it was about 10,000 feet, uh, it was 400 feet long, approximately, and about 250 feet wide and about 50 feet thick. It was shaped like a football field, rounded edges on it. And the thing took off and did a, a circle. As everyone watched with their jaws dropping, and I followed it with my finger, I said, everyone see that? And they said, <laughs> yes. And I followed it around. It took about 10 seconds to make its circle. And it was about a 30-degree angle. So at 10,000 feet, that was 2,000 miles per hour instant instant and then stopped on a dime it yes. like took off instantly at that speed came back stopped instantly in the same spot while the other ship was still there and uh, so it glowed a dark green color and you could see the purple Tesla Corona coming out from above on the top and in front of it and the bottom this represents screwed the with neg a positive negative charge. Yeah, it's a ne negative charge. It's that purple Tesla Corona going out in the sky like this and on the bottom was a positive Corona, but it's a dark green. They had apparently used quite a number of technologies to try to make that ship invisible. It wasn't supposed to be visible, but it was visible because of the weather conditions at the time. So this and idea of uh, UFOs appearing and disappearing uh, before people's eyes wouldn't be too hard to swallow if uh, what is happening with this electrical Corona is distorting the area around the ship. Plus, they move instantly. This thing can move in if you're if you're perpendicular to the line of flight you cannot see it at that speed if it's close enough you can't see it at all when it's moving as fast as it can move so it appears to just they they look like they're disappearing here and going over here you see they can jump around because you cannot see that ship when it's moving too fast uh, if they suddenly take off it looks like they disappear all you see is a, it's gone but they're just moving very fast. They can accelerate instantly. So weight is no object. Weight is no Size object. Size is no object. With the, if you take a force, okay, if you take a stronger force, you can do a lot more work in the same period of time. Work is 
the ability to do work. I mean, energy is the ability to do work. Work is movement of a mass through a distance. Uh, therefore, if you use a stronger force, you can do more work in the same period of time. So if you use a force which is, which is 10 to the 40th power stronger than the gravitational force, you can do that much more work, 10 to the 40th power times more work in the same period of time with that force. Now that's a free energy idea because if you take a weak force and convert it to, a, to that stronger force, you can do a lot more work than you could as a weak force. So you can take gravitational energy, convert it into electrical energy, and do 10 to the 40th times more work with it. It would seem obvious uh, why certain energy cartels wouldn't want that kind of information floating around. Uh, it, it will destroy them when it gets out, and it will. Yeah, know. I'd like to uh, talk further on some more uh, free energy ideas. Just to finish up with... Uh, Actually, I want to ask you about Kenneth Arnold and his sightings, but uh, initially what, what is interesting about uh, this flying submarine business is Kenneth Arnold uh, had some interesting comments to make uh, about some flying saucers that were appearing here in America. Arnold uh, insisted nevertheless that Morella bring him up to date, finally settled for a written account for which he uh, uh, Apparently, he was interviewing a lot of uh, witnesses. At this time, the West Coast was experiencing a siege of reports about mysterious submarines operating off United States coastlines. Arnold told Klein he is convinced there is a definite link between the saucers and the submarines. There you go. He uh, makes a reference to submarines and UFOs, which I and find notice an interesting he subjected to press ridicule. That's interesting. See. Yeah, why would that if, be? If the government didn't know what it was, they would be the first to be there to interrogate Arnold to find out what it was. If they didn't know what it was, they would certainly be interested, and they certainly wouldn't want to ridicule somebody that they would like to debrief. I mean, it, that tells you right there. Now, what I'm saying is in the stalemate, they worked out certain conditions where the Germans continued to, to cooperate through the United States government this stuff, and so the continuity wasn't broken between the German projects and the American projects. They flew, they brought 15,000 personnel to New Mexico with that, along with, uh, there were 116 top uh, scientists taken to Alamogordo, for example, and one of them was the one that tested the Lafferentz project in the Baltic, the first firing of a, of a rocket from underwater in, in one of these little Lafferentz subs. And, uh, Gee, where have we heard about that before? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <coughs> also, uh, if, if we reference back to uh, Kenneth Arnold's very famous, yeah, very famous um, sighting, uh, which started the whole UFO craze in 1947, uh, right here we have his quote, this very bright flash like an arc light, was coming from a group of objects far up to the north of Mount Rainier in the area of Mount Baker, which is almost in line with Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. I saw a chain of peculiar aircraft approaching Mount Rainier very rapidly. They seemed to fly in, a, in an echelon formation. However, in looking at them against the sky and against the snow of Mount Rainier as they approached, I just couldn't discern any tails on them. And I had never seen an aircraft without a tail. These were fairly large sized, and there were nine of them. Well, that, like that, an arc lamp is an interesting reference. That's Boeing makes. territory, by the way. That's oh. all the German scientists that worked out the contracts with uh, with Boeing aircraft were uh, building American prototypes up there already by 1947. Huh. Well, again, that's quite a coincidence. Um, here we have a picture of uh, Kenneth Arnold himself holding up a, an interesting photograph of his flying saucer. Um, That's a I'm, drawing of the kind he saw? Yes. That looks a lot like a Horton flying wing. Well, that's <laughs> that's interesting you should mention that because we have a picture of a Horton flying wing uh, so that we can make a comparison. Yeah. Gee, yeah. you think One that's what he saw? But you see... That's the reason I think that there's a possibility that maybe Kenneth Arnold might be guilty of disinformation. So because you, you there feel you see jet engines, you see. Sure. 
that's not a flying saucer if you've got jet engines on it. So it's well, the interesting powered. reference I'd like you to comment on is his uh, his remark about uh, the the blue light like an arc lamp. Do you feel that maybe he did see uh, something and that, that they were using something uh, in addition to just jet uh, turbojets uh, on the back there? He might have been trying to develop some sort of hybrid technology where they could... See, one of the problems with some of these saucers is getting them off the ground because uh, what happens is is the electrical energy tends to arc to the ground a lot of times, so they've got to get them up in the air somehow before they take off. And they've used various kinds of rocket and jet power sometimes to get them off the ground. You mentioned that in, in respect to uh, Lonnie Zamora's yeah, uh, yeah. sighting. And that's what they observed there was these blue what looked like maybe something like ion jets or something. You see, chemical uh, rockets that were to get it up off the ground so they could put kick in the electric power. Uh, that way they didn't need so much uh, in the way of landing gear. If they could, you know, if they could soften the landing on these things and, and the takeoffs, uh, then they just needed some little pods that sure. came out to land on. Here, here's a... Uh photograph of his, uh, his original sketch uh, shows a wedge type uh, or heel shaped uh, craft and here's an early photograph of again a heel shaped craft this looks like it has some kind of glow to it um, your comments yeah I think that they were experimenting around with different shapes uh, basically I think it all has boiled down to what you call, what you might call the lenticular and the linear. Well, the lenticular type is, is a linear type and the circular type. Uh, basically, the ship that I saw at Los Alamos, I mean at, at uh, Hyde Park above Santa Fe, uh, it was a huge lenticle, you see. It was a huge lozenge shape. And you think about that, it was as big as a football field with the track around it. Five-story building, 50 feet thick. Uh, I'm, I'm going on proportion because I worked with proportion as a sculptor and a painter, so I can calculate proportional uh, shape and size and, and so forth pretty well. And this thing would be like a flying five-story building as big as that shape inside a football field and a track. Now, that, that's a huge shape. That is huge. And what are they going to do with this ship? Now, the big question of me is how are they hiding these things? Uh, yeah, where are they hiding and these they have, And I have heard all kinds of scenarios from reliable people, uh, people who know about um, such landing schemes in places like Switzerland, where they have whole cliffs or whole mountainsides that slide out and the ship goes inside and then the ship clo the whole mountain closes back up. You're saying people have might have seen something like this? Yes, I know people that have seen stuff like this. And uh, I also know that there are people who have seen these things go into water. So what would be better than to have a lake Absolutely. just as a landing pad for this ship that goes underwater, and then there's a dolly down there that pulls it sideways into a, into a place up the hill that's out of the water or through an airlock. In fact, uh, there have been several uh, sightings in Puerto Rico uh, in lagoons out there in Puerto Rico, and to make it even more convenient, these are held by the United States as uh, wetlands, <laughs> so that there's no human uh, contact on these things, and these uh, Puerto Ricans, these poor people are, are seeing these lights going into the water over there. So that, that seems to be another cozy aspect of, uh, you know, keeping this international biosphere uh, program going on, is that you can do anything with the, the land uh, that you want, including landing football-sized uh, flying saucers under the water. Well, it, you know, all you need is, is uh, unlimited funds, and, uh, <laughs> and you've got it, you know. Yes, who do we know that has unlimited <laughs> funds? Hmm. Uh, Anything, you see, my theory is, this is the only thing that's theoretical that, I, that I'm saying, is why have they kept it secret so long? And my theory is the big corporations don't want us to have this technology because when you start making a list of everything that this thing is going to obsolesce, it's a lot. It's a big Transportation, list. Uh, 
fuel, uh, all kinds of things, aeronautical companies, airlines, spare you name it, spare parts. There's not a lot to wear out. Uh, and who runs but, the airlines, the CIA? And, yeah. <laughs> you want to put and, them out of business? Uh, you know, when you start looking at that, it's my opinion that the only reason the military even is allowed to use this technology is so that they can uh, argue that it's a national security interest to be protected and use the government to yeah. protect the technology from us. In other words, to keep us from not, I'm talk, not talking about the Russians or Chinese, their governments have this same technology. The only reason they keep it secret is to keep us, the citizens who pay for it, from finding out how uh, and using it. Right. Uh, and so they here's the government telling these outrageous lies to every child in America, every adult in America, and every old person in America uh, about and, aliens. They've concocted this whole thing and, and the intelligence sure, network distributed right. it through through uh, making uh, sure that we're dumbed down enough to where a lot of people would actually buy that. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not surprised at this recent scandal that they dug up about the dumbness of the school books they're writing. Huh. You know, that's no surprise to me. No, of course not. And, uh, Actually, that's been a, a, a an ever-present dream of uh, certain uh, groups in our society for uh, over a hundred years. They've uh, been stealing and hiding technology for so long. They don't want it to move any faster. They want it to move real slow. Sure. Uh, because they've got all the technology they want us to have, and uh, they want to keep it moving slow because they've got all that oil to sell us, and they're jacking up the prices whenever they think they can get away with it. Sure. And uh, and when and they know that every time they jack up the prices, though, it stimulates vapor carburetor research, and <laughs> uh, so they can only jack the price up for a while, and then they have to drop it back down again to kill the research. You right. see. Then people forget and, about that. To give you an idea of uh, what we were capable of in 1947, uh, re referring once again back to uh, Kenneth Arnold's um, sighting, uh, on the way he made some rough calculations of the speed of the formation from the timing he had done near Mount Rainier. He came up with an answer of around 1,700 miles an hour in 1947. That now, could be the Horton Jets. You see. Do you think that they would achieve that kind of speed? Yeah, I think they could have. You know, you never know how fast a plane goes. You can never rely on any published information about its speed. I mean, if you look at an old Jane's manual, you'll see that in many cases the, velo the, the top speed of the aircraft and all the other characteristics are classified, still classified at certain times. So they usually won't even tell you. And if they do tell you, you can't really know whether it's true or not. You know, it could be much faster. Sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, you never really know what the top speed of an aircraft is from, because usually they won't even publish it. They'll show the picture of it in the manual, but they won't tell you how fast or how fast its climb rate is or, and so forth. Its performance characteristics may be classified, but I believe they could have gotten, with some of those Horton planes, they could have gotten close to that. Uh, from what I saw, the pictures of these things, those are pretty advanced designs. Uh, what they do is they don't want this technology to go too fast. So they they get a lead and they just want it to go at a certain speed as long as they're faster than the Russian planes or whatever. Right. And, as long as, uh, uh, yeah, just, just uh, to keep that edge. Um, meanwhile, just, they're going 25,000 miles an hour like the one I saw in 1953. And then they're talking, kidding. they've got articles all out there in the papers that they're controlling talking about how we might be on the verge of discovering <laughs> anti-gravity technology. Yeah, you know? I suppose our old friend Mirabo uh, yeah. figured that one out for us, too. I'd like to thank Mr. Lyon for being our guest on the 33rd Parallel. I hope there are many who feel as I do that it's a good and healthy thing to entertain alternative views on items of such importance as our world history and scientific progress. This is, in fact, the primary objective of this video series. I hope you found it worthwhile, and remember, the truth can flow from lies, but lies cannot flow from the truth. Good night. A companion guide to the 33rd Parallel video series will soon be available. Look for it on our website at www.flyingsaucerfactory.com. Also available now from the Flying Saucer Factory. 
a German U-boat on the United States coastline, a secret agreement between sworn enemies, an underground base built into the permafrost of Antarctica, Rear Admiral Byrd and his armada of 4,000 men in a confrontation with unknown aircraft that can fly from pole to pole in a matter of minutes. When reading about it isn't enough, it's time to see what you've been missing. A graphic dramatization of Admiral Byrd's Operation High Jump, fully illustrated by a top Disney TV animator. Order it now from the Flying Saucer Factory at www.flyingsaucerfactory.com.